My name is Mary O'Keefe. I was born in Ontario, Oregon, 1952. My dad was an attorney. My mom was a housewife, had seven children. I was the oldest girl, but I um, had three older brothers. So three older brothers, three girls, and then the baby was a boy. So that's how I came to be. <laughs> what? Just let you go. I don't know. You have to be di more directive. Being raised in Eastern Oregon, it was a very conservative community for the most part. My parents were not conservative. Um, but we were not a political family. Um, I went to public school through the 12th grade and then I went to a Jesuit university in Spokane. And there was a lot going on, of course, during that period. And I was never very political. Um, I ended up graduating, getting a master's in counseling, um, and ultimately going to Portland. Had a hard time finding employment in Portland, and I went to work for a grassroots organization called Oregon Fair Share. Oregon Fair Share um, had concerns with the statewide uh, disparities in the economy and also organized around neighborhood issues, anything that the neighborhood identified as problems. So um, lousy streets, putting in stop signs, um, safety, whatever the neighborhood identified. So we did a lot of training on how to be, um, you know, your own advocate. And the whole principle being there was strength in numbers. The statewide issues were cost of living issues like utility rates and things like that. Um, I started as a canvasser, was the canvas director, um, worked <laughs> nonstop, and um, met my to-be wife and decided to move to Southern Oregon. I, I did a variety of jobs in Southern Oregon. Um, I started as the campaign worker for Jay Mullen who was running a state senate race and uh, his campaign manager left the campaign and I got tagged to be the campaign manager. None of this stuff was really in my wheelhouse, um, but it was a really good experience. He lost to Lynn Hannon, which is a name that you're probably familiar with. Um, but from there, I um, went to work uh, for the Dunn House. And Molly Owens and I were co-directors for the Dunn House. They came to us because the shelter had run out of money and we had a lot of fundraising experience. So um, that's what we did. We worked really hard and we did a variety of fundraising activities. And what year was that? Um, that was 1982 to 1983. I only know this because I have a resume. <laughs> um, and then the Dunn House merged with another, with all the crisis uh, oriented organizations and became CIS, Crisis Intervention Services. 
and they decided that there was really only room for one director and Molly became the director of Dun Dunhouse and then my next job was to work for Head Start and I got hired as a family advocate and I did that for a time but due to the very poor wages uh, at Head Start um, I went to work for United Way and I did United Way for about three and a half, four years. And I was the associate director for United Way. Um, from there, I, I uh, went to work for the Job Council, which no longer exists. <laughs> um, but it was the employment and training organization. And it largely had uh, federal grants to do various employment and training um, services for youth and adults and my job was really program development which was fabulous and uh, because really what I'm best at is startup that's really what I'm most interested in and so I did a variety of projects for them um, I think one of my first tasks was a four county economic development initiative. The state, uh, I think it was Gold, Governor Goldschmidt had a bunch of money and they did um, uh, economic development activities around the state. And we were asked to regionalize so we uh, worked with Josephine County, Klamath County and one other county, I can't remember, maybe Douglas. Anyway, um, so I was charged with helping them develop their plan. Um, uh, the next project I got was welfare reform. So I w that was a multi-agency effort um, to uh, basically redesign how we were offering welfare ser services. And largely what we tried to do was open up training opportunities for people on welfare who had been prohibited to do so and so the idea was to um, if they got training <laughs> they would find decent employment and they wouldn't have to fall back on welfare. Um, A thing that I was able to do was work with a group of women um, to look at economic issues affecting women. And that group did a lot of planning. We did this analysis of, of where people, where women were working, what kinds of jobs were they getting, and what kind of income were they making, and what were their barriers that's what really inspired this sort of strategic analysis of the kinds of services that were needed to lift women out of poverty, to lift women into d better paying jobs, to give them more opportunities in entrepreneurial adventures. One of the things that we were really looking at was microenterprise development. So um, we decided to form a board that would try to develop essentially a set of services and also to secure funding. Um, I basically had to kill our task force because it was becoming <laughs> something that Everything that we came up with, I got charged with developing. <laughs> and I could only do so much. So I said, okay, people, um, if, if you guys want to continue on, that's fine. But I, I have enough on my plate. That's about what I can handle. So I left the job council. I became the executive director of what we call Southern Oregon Women's Access to Credit. And so, uh, for four years, I think, from 1990 to 1994, roughly, um, 
I was at the job council. I was volunteering on the SOAC board with a number of terrific women. Um, a woman, the director of the Small Business Development Center, uh, a local attorney, a local financial planner, several, several women entrepreneurs, Molly Owens was, was on the board. And we came up with a, a set of services that included a microenterprise development training program, a uh, mentorship program in which we paired local women entrepreneurs with our students, and also a, a lending program. So we had all these great services on paper and we actually had started uh, a little bit of training. But it was really hard work to be working full time and then be starting a, a nonprofit on top of that. And we decided as a board, look, we either have to get a grant and get this thing self-funded and get staff <clears throat> or we can't continue this. This is going to kill us. Um, so fortunately, we got a big grant from the Mott Foundation, and we were able to hire a director. We couldn't find a director we wanted to hire, and so I decided, well, we'd work this hard. I would just leave my job at the job council, and I would become the director. And so um, I did that. Uh, and about three months into the job, I thought I was completely insane. Um, but uh, I just really buckled down and figured out everything that we needed to do as an organization. And um, I think when I left, they had almost a half a million dollars in the bank. And we had six staff. And we were serving Jackson, Josephine, and Klamath counties, and uh, we had graduated several small business, micro enterprise businesses. We had also developed a program for Latinos, and so we had Spanish speaking staff. Well, I think I have always had a little bit of an entrepreneurial strain in me. I've done a few different little things, including a making and selling jewelry. And when I was working on that, I was talking to a um, community member here in the Rogue Valley about that I was doing jewelry and how enjoyable it was developing this teeny business. And he, it was a man who uh, said to me, there's a place called Southern Oregon Women's Access to Credit. So I went there and took their class, their business plan development class. This would be in the early 90s, all the bases of financial record keeping, financial management, marketing, product development. It was, it was a good class, absolutely. That aspect of the SOAC program as um, it had to have been going through the class. It wasn't part of the loan thing. So it was a, an end piece to the class. You were assigned a mentor and uh, a successful business person. She owned a successful spa in Ashland. And, um, and I know in the years since she has written a book and a wonderful woman. Um, and we would meet, I'm going to, it was a few years ago, so I want to be accurate here. It feels like it was slightly more than once a month. It certainly wasn't weekly, but it, it feels like it was maybe every three weeks or something. We would meet generally at her place. I would come to her house and I would present, here's what I want to work on. By the way, this was not with beanbags, it was with my jewelry business, because that's what I went through the class for. And, and they also made sure there was some relevance to her experience and my needs. And, and there was, she sold products at her spa, and you know she was so familiar with the kind of cu customer that is 
my customer. So it was a perfect fit, it, just absolutely perfect. She gave so I have thought many times over the years how just how wonderful that was of her to give these you know hours to me to come in. Okay, let's talk about display, and I have a memory of her in in action kind of maybe with a scarf or something literally showing me okay and you could do this with because because the subject was display at that moment and yeah. i was like oh yeah that's an idea um and th but then there was also financial uh, you know assistance with financial management um so it was you know wonderful community of um other entrepreneurs many the majority women, but not quite exclusively, but the majority women. And um, one day there was a an event which was kind of a fair showcasing the businesses of, um, I'm going to pause for a moment and say that the acronym for Southern Oregon Women's Access to Credit is SOAC. So I'll be calling it SOAC and I wanted to make that acronym clear. So this was a fair showcasing SOAC businesses. And I, you know, knew some of the people and there was a woman there who I was friendly with named Corey. And Corey suddenly came to me like rushing towards me and said, Mona, we, you know what we have to do? We have to make gift bags for coffee and tea. And what she meant was those kind of insulated bags with the fold over tabs that we get in a grocery store but the idea was have them covered with artistic pictures to celebrate the holidays, celebrate birthdays, and kind of just because, you know, for no special occasion. And the impetus had been that she had seen someone's packaging. She thought they were gift bags for coffee and tea. When she got closer, she saw that it was packaging for like right, uh, uh, specialty rice. And so that's when she got the idea, came to me. And in that instant, something I had never even thought of doing, in an instant, we were off to the races to, towards developing this business idea, which meant, you know, various, um, it meant a lot of details, a lot of work to do finding the vendor for the bags, choosing the artist. We had a contest at Corey's home. We set up like a gallery of um, uh, local artists' pictures, had people come and vote. And out of that, we chose our initial 12 designs. And then um, finding a printer. And of course, the ultimately we reached the point where it was time to truly get this underway and that meant getting funding to do the printing to get the bags to do the marketing and we went to SOAC because in addition to the um, business loan uh, the business classes they had a small business loan fund and it made it more accessible for people who were small whose businesses were small whose needs weren't that big, you know, didn't need a big loan, but needed a place to go. And we were quite honestly, Corey and I were at the level that a bank would not have been very interested in looking at us for a, you know, typical business loan. So it was wonderful to have this place that was giving loans in the ten, fifteen thousand dollar $15,000 area to up to 2025, I think. It was tough for women to get bank loans. It wasn't um, that they couldn't, it was difficult. So that's why we had a micro, in, micro lending program. We, we would lend up to $10,000. We had a number of successes. I mean, and they were small businesses. It's like a, a jam and jelly company. Uh, went through our program. A, a woman who engraved rocks. I mean, there's one of her rocks right there. <laughs> um, just a variety of projects that that women. Um, we had a, a woman. This didn't ev 
ultimately become a success, successful venture, but it was a brilliant idea. It was a matchmaking service. Um, and she kind of got edged out just by bigger funded um, projects that were on, are already on the line, online. It was unbelievable, <laughs> really. Um, the, the local economic development interests, um, I think, felt like, why are you doing this? They, they really had no awareness or no consciousness of how little they were doing to support women entrepreneurs. And they just kind of thought we were upstarts and we had no business doing their business. And it was hard. It was hard. It was hard to uh, convince people that we were necessary. And so we would just have women tell their stories. And once you heard their stories, how could you argue with the need for our services? And, you know, local communities like out in the Illinois Valley, um, it, it was completely obvious to poor, impoverished community why this service was necessary. So we would take our, our training out to the Illinois Valley, for example. We would take it up to the Upper Rogue. So our, our whole impetus was to go where people lived rather than ask them to come to Medford or ask them to come to Ashland. And so we partnered with libraries, with different community organizations that would provide us with a free space. And we tried to do it on the cheap as much as possible because we didn't have a lot of money and we weren't charging a lot of money. Our whole philosophy was if you could pay, you know, as little as five dollars, you could take our training. So. <laughs> but the, we felt it was important that they paid something. Yeah. I know that we ultimately influenced government because uh, state economic development um, recognized our organization and we helped start other microenterprise organizations around the state of Oregon. We formed an association. We worked very collaboratively with the state economic development department that funded each of our organizations. And we, we were also funded by the, the federal government on, in the Small Business ad Administration. Um, I'm pretty sure we got county grants as well. So, well, our loan fund was, was established through federal money from the microenterprise program through the SBA, the women's, there was a specific women's microenterprise program funded through the Small Business Administration. And so the only way you could qualify for a loan is that you'd have to go through our 10-week uh, business plan development. And uh, we had a loan officer on staff and we would have those business plans reviewed by other entrepreneurs and our loan officer. And uh, people could qualify for up to $10,000. And then the loan repayment was based on a schedule and it would vary from business to business based on their business plan. We uh, prepared our business plan and we had both been through the SOAC class, so we had a head start on how to prepare it and worked on that, um, you know, making a marketing plan and projections on 
uh, where we would sell, how much we would sell, you know, the distribution channels through which we would sell. And then I um, met with a loan fund committee, which as I recall was all female. And um, I'm pretty sure of that. And they approved it. And so we got a loan, which again, this was Corey and I, and her name as Corey Cooper at the time, her married name. And um, so it was, we were splitting it. It was 20,000. So it was, we were each taking $10,000 debt. And um, then, and the review process of the loan, yeah, it didn't, it didn't feel, it didn't feel easy. It felt that they were, you know, that we were really under review, that we might not get this, that we hoped we did, we hoped we were doing good enough in our responses, but we had no sense that, oh, this is, this is nothing, we'll, you know, let's just answer these few questions and waltz out of here. It was like a real, uh, meeting with banker, you know, in a sense with bankers, like it would have been. Got ramped up, or got production going, got the bags from the source, got the um, printing done locally at a place called Mustard Press, which is still in business, and um, very, and connected with local graphic designers, and accountants and even an attorney to do some basic um the, we decided and i'll tell you why i paused because it was so unnecessary but we incorporated and just for the whatever the heck of it i will share although it's such a small detail that that was a an expense that i later looked back on and thought what a waste of money that was <laughs> but anyway but we did do that and um and we did our launch at a coffee uh, industry fair in Seattle in the fall of 1996. And it was, it was wonderful. The whole experience, there's so much um, good that came out of it. It did lead me into this counseling and teaching. I'll just mention that teaching, for instance, at the time I started Beanbags and, and then a few years later went to work for SOAC. You couldn't have gotten me to get up in front of a group of people and teach if you had threatened me with something. It was like, oh no, I'm too scared. And I came to love teaching, it, and I was happy in that environment. But but totally, I will. Sh Some women were really doing important things, helping women. It is that SOAC. Before I got there. There was that moment in time when it was formed. It was being formed by this group of women who saw a need and um, came together and, and worked on making it a reality. We never excluded men from the program, but by virtue of our name, uh, it tended to be women. But then, you know, we, we saw the inequities happening for Latino people. And so the board felt strongly that we needed to branch out and also serve that population. And that did tend to be more m men than women, although there were some uh, um, Latin, Latinas in the program. It was a great organization. Unfortunately, um, four or five years after I'd left, they had run out of money and they didn't have the capacity for whatever reason to generate grants to keep it going. It was hard work. It was really hard work. I left, I left SOAC in 2000. I went to work for the community college. I continued to always have an interest and a desire to support uh, the programs that, that benefited females. Um, my, my job there was largely grants development. So I continued to write grants for our child care program. Um, for programs, I, I wrote a a very large uh, healthcare training grant, and uh, because 
if you if you look at employment, as I've said many times, um, healthcare is an is an arena that is tends to be better paying, and so that was I think really important to both the college and to myself to really help students, you know, train and and qualify for better paying jobs. So that's a, a real strong area of interest of the community college as well. So. I mean, I did a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know, I did a lot of construction grants and a lot of stuff that that benefited uh, all all the students. But clearly, women was a big interest of mine. Would you like to uh, uh, say anything to sort of wrap this up or bring it forward? About changes that still might need to be made. You mentioned before some disappointments. I don't know. I mean, uh, I mean, I left the college in 2017. Um, I, w I retired, but I also had got cancer. So that kind of waylaid me for a while. And now I'm, I'm volunteering and uh, I help um, the Ollie program at SOU, so lifelong learning for seniors. And um, I volunteer for the Jackson County Cultural Coalition. I'm on their board. So I, I try to, you know, continue to serve the community. Um, and I'm in awe of what's happening politically. Um, there's a lot of tremendous work and passion going on today and so it gives me hope for the future and um, you know I do think that a lot of what we did formed the foundation for what's happening today because of activism and advocacy I think we formed a really strong base and really helped position women to go forward. I, I, one of the things I did at the community college is I served on the diversity board at the college and I, I was fascinated by how little <laughs> students really knew their, the history and I'm, I'm sure that's true today. But in a way, it doesn't really matter because, um, you know, that foundation was there for them. That, that launching pad was there for them. And they're taking advantage of it, and it's going forward. So the work continues, and if they can't look back over their shoulder, that's okay.